So hello everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Samantha Shokin. I manage public programs at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust in New York City. Today we are joined by Mark Sullivan and Mel Leitner for a discussion of Mark's 2017 novel, Beneath a Scarlet Sky, based on the true story of forgotten war hero Pino Lela. When his family home in Milan is destroyed by Allied bombs, Pino joins an underground Underground Railroad helping Jews escape over the Alps. In an attempt to protect him, Pino's parents force him to enlist as a German soldier. But after Pino is injured, he is recruited to become the personal driver for Hitler's left hand in Italy, General Hans Lehrs, one of the Third Reich's most mysterious and powerful commanders. Now with the opportunity to spy for the Allies inside the German high command, Pino endures the horrors of the war and the Nazi occupation by fighting in secret. So that's a little bit about the book. Um, Mark is the acclaimed author of 18 novels, including the number one New York Times best-selling best private series, which he, written, which he co-wrote with James Patterson. Mark has received numerous awards for his writing, and his works have been named a New York Times notable book and Los Angeles Times best book of the year. Mark also worked as an investigative journalist for many years and served in the Peace Corps in West West Af Africa. Today he lives with his wife in Montana, where he is joining us from today. Hello, Mark. Hi, um, thank you for having me. Thank you. And Mel Leitner, uh, who is just below there. Uh, Mel was a reporter and editor of Hard News for more than 15 years, much of it as a foreign correspondent for uh, United Press International and NBC News covering the Middle East. He is the author of the soon to be published, What They Didn't Burn, How Hidden Nazi Documents Proved a Survivor's Holocaust Stories. Mel began his career as a reporter with UPI covering New York City from where he is joining us today. So welcome Mel. Hello. Hi. Um, so just a few quick housekeeping notes. Uh, we will have time, about 15 minutes, for audience Q&A at the conclusion of the program. If you would like to ask Mark or Mel a question, Feel free to submit your questions or comments into the chat box or the Q&A form, and we'll do our best to get to as many as we can. Uh, and also, today's program is being recorded, and it will, it, it will be uploaded to YouTube in the coming days. Uh, and for all today's registrants, I will send out a, a follow-up email with a link to the program and to Mark's book. Um, so that is it for me. And without further ado, here's Mark and Mel. Uh, Mark, before we get into the book itself, I think it would be helpful if we gave the setting of the story, the big picture, if you will, and some historical background. Like, we know that Mussolini in 1938 passed a series of anti-Semitic laws that stripped Jews of their property, banned kids from going to school, and more. But I personally wasn't aware that even after Hitler essentially occupied Italy in 1943, that most of the Jewish community escaped the worst of the Holocaust. Yeah. In fact, from what we've read, of some 48,000 Jews in Italy in 1943, about 40,000 survived in 1945. Now, 20% is no small number, but yeah. compared to Poland, compared to the Ukraine, compared even to Holland, that's quite quite impressive. Um, can you give us a brief overview of what you've learned about this effort in Italy? Sure. Um, first, I want to uh, apologize if I sound a little slurry. I'm getting used at 62 to wearing braces. Um, but yeah, I think it's really important to understand that prior to 38, uh, even back like in 29, Mussolini was being highly critical of what they called Nordicism or Aryanism. And he, he, he sets out on a series of military campaigns in Africa and other places, and it depletes a lot of his resources. So he starts growing closer and closer to Hitler in the mid to late 30s. And to appease Hitler, he passes these laws. Um, prior, he was on the record as saying that he thought Jews were a fully a part of Italian society. Um, they'd been there for 2,000 years. He considered them more part of the Mediterranean uh, than they were of an Aryan race. 
uh, and that was Italians as well. So um, you have Hitler invading after Mussolini uh, in 1943 is arrested by the king. And he's arrested by the king because he's lost in Africa, he's lost in Macedonia, and a big part of his army has been slammed in Russia. So it's important to understand that. And he signs this thing in 39 with Hitler called the Pact of Steel, in which they're fully allied. Um, but again, it, the Jews are being pushed into ghettos. They're not being treated well. They can't teach. They can't study. They can't own certain kinds of businesses, etc. cetera. Um, so we get right in, in about August, July of 1943, we get an invasion of by Hitler because the allies are poised to come in and they're fighting in Sicily. And they know that a lot of people considered Italy to be the soft underbelly of Europe. And it was a way for the allies to go straight at, straight up and around and into uh, to Germany. Um, but they send in, you know, like nine divisions and they also start building fortifications. And it isn't until they declare the Sallow Republic, which is the northern half, the non, the occupied half of Italy, um, that they begin to go after the Jews. And um, there's a lot of, a lot of Jews are already starting to get out. They've been getting out from 38 on, if they could. Uh, and, but now it, the pressure's on because they're all there. And there's certain people who understand what's about to happen and there's certain people who don't get it. Um, there was a rabbi, Zoli, in uh, uh, Rome. He got it. He understood what was happening. Um, and, but other people weren't. And it all sort of comes to a head in late August, early September. So they declare the Salo Republic in, in uh, the 7th of September. And the 8th or 9th uh, in northern Italy, the first atrocities start. Okay, they go to a place in Mena in northern Italy. It's on Lago Maggiore. And um, there are 50 Jews in a hotel there that no longer exists. It did exist when I did the research. And it was without a doubt one of the creepiest places I've ever been in my life. Um, so they come in and uh, the SS gets sent there and uh, they round up all 49 of the 50 Jews and they take them to the edge of the lake and they make them dive in and then they machine gun. There's only one survivor, a young girl named Becky Bahar who is riding her bike uh, along the lake shore and sees the massacre from across this point the hotel sat on a point and she flips out and goes racing for her parents and a catholic woman comes out and grabs her and saves her so roughly the same time in uh north of lake como so here's here's lago maggiore um here's uh, lake como and north of lake como is a small town called campo dolcino Several hundred meters above Campo Dolcino um, is a small town called Medesimo, and above Medesimo is a small village called Moda. And Moda is where um, a very courageous priest named Don Luigi Ray ran a summer camp for kids, boys mostly. He believed that boys were best uh, developed by challenging them in the mountains. Um, it was a common thing around there. There was a, um, a Boy Scout, the equivalent of the Boy Scouts in Italy, and, and they become critical in this. Uh, and so there was this whole tradition of, they called them the Alpine. They would all climb, they would get strong, et cetera, et cetera. Well, when the bombardment of Milan happens, um, wealthy Milanese families start sending their kids to get out of the bombardment, they send them to Father Ray's camp, which has now been turned into a school. And um, right around that time, so it's like the 6th or 7th of September, there's a seminarian up there named Giovanni Barbareschi. And Barbareschi, there are also three Jews who want to get to Switzerland. And Barbareschi comes up with this idea of taking the entire crew of boys on a hike and they're going to go around this thing 
called the, um, the angel step over into a back valley. And at the end of that valley, at the other end of the lake, there's a piece of Italy that juts into the woods there. And um, so the whole idea was 30 people went out and 27 came back because no one's counting. Uh, and, Mark, if I could yeah. just ask, um, this became a thing. This became a thing. Okay. Um, how well, because of Barbaresky, it becomes a thing. But okay. How, how extensive was this, what you call underground railroad? How, how extensive did it become based on your research? Just how many people and how many Jews were? 2,166 Jews went out by various routes, including the Mota route. The Where biggest did you get route, this information from, Mark? Um, the Shoah Foundation in Milan, which okay. documented it all. And I was able to interview Barbareski at length about 13 years ago, which was an absolute honor uh, for me. Barbareski's greatest treasure in life was his commendation for his bravery um, uh, in saving Jews from the, the Zion Society of Italy. Uh, he's enshrined in a um, Garden of the Righteous there as well. Um, but what Barbareski, what his brilliant move was, was he knew that this was going to be a thing. And he went down and told Father Ray, I'm going to leave. I'm going to go into Milan because somebody's got to organize this and someone's got to create documents. And actually, Barbareski, he's this really noble figure. Not only does he get involved with the partisans, but he becomes the forger for the Jewish uh, documents. So the idea was you gave them all new documents that identified them as Italian, gave them new names. They weren't allowed to use their old names. And there was a process by which they were funneled to various escape routes all along the Alps in Northern Italy, bordering Switzerland. Remember, Switzerland is a neutral country and uh, people believed that they would be protected there. So this route sets up with um, Ray agreeing to be one of the stations. Now the biggest station, the biggest route out is a place about 28 kilometers this way to the more to the northeast of Lake Como and it's called Val Cordera. Um, and Val Cordera was more remote than Moda. Uh, once you got way up the valley, there was little or no structures or civilization. So they, they brought out many of them along that route. In Moda, you know, as high as 300, 400, it's hard to tell because Ray, he had this, Father Ray absolutely believed in the concept of sanctuary. And he believed that if people needed sanctuary, he was giving it to them. So he did it for allied um, down pilots, uh, OSS people who needed to get out. Um, but after the war, he also protected Hitler's translator in Italy. Yeah, that, that was an highly controversial. Uh, let's turn to the book's reluctant hero. I think that's a, a good time sure. to do it. Uh, Pino Lella. You write that he uh, ferried uh, Jewish refugees through the Alps uh, numerous times. Uh, tell us a little bit about the man himself, the man that you got to know. Well, I would say he's probably one of the humblest people I've ever met. He did not understand why I wanted to write about him. He didn't consider himself a hero in any way. He said that you know anybody would have done what he had done and given the circumstances to help people. I mean, you have to understand when you meet him, he, he's an incredibly warm individual and it's genuine. And it's there from the second you encounter the guy. And he's very genteel and, and mannered and he speaks brilliant English and brilliant French and you know, of course, brilliant Italian. And um, he also tended to underplay things. That was his, his most common thing. And as a journalist, I noticed this you know, early on when we went up to Campo Dolcino, Medesimo, and Mota, and um, all the way up, you know, the, the pass from uh, Como, he was saying, well, you know, any competent alpinist could do what I did. Right, and I get to the bottom in Campo Dolcino, and I'm seeing the first bump 
uh, that he's got to go up and it's, it's like really steep and we get up to Medesi Mall and I mean, it's like this and that was just the north route. The, the route on the Angel Step was easier. It was longer, but it was easier. But here's the deal. Not every Italian was kind to Jewish refugees. There were people who you could pay to take you on various routes of escape. And some of them took the money and turned Jews in. That's true. Um, so there was this town over there that was notorious for that kind of thing. Um, they were very uh, protective of that pass, especially the angel step. So um, they very quickly began to go around to the north, which was sheer. And then finally they had the only way out as the snow came was up the spine. About and how many how many trips uh, do you think did you deduce that Lalo met? How, how many times? He took like thirty to thirty five, and his oh, for brother, what period of time? So this would have been his first run was early October nineteen forty three, and he leaves on the twenty eighth or twenty ninth of April because his parents believe he's about to be conscripted because he's about to turn 18. So, um, so in that time frame is when he does it. So over the course of one, two, three, you know, eight, seven months, I think that's about right. Um, after you met Lalo, you, you write in your preface that you did 10 years of research before. Were you ever, ever able to, how were you able to uh, confirm his story? Yeah. Well, first of all, the stuff that I could confirm, I confirmed in the war archives in Berlin and Freiburg, Germany, as well as in the U.S. National Archives, as well as in the Holocaust, U.S. Holocaust Museum, and as well as you know, studying stuff in Yad Vashem. The interesting thing about this story I found is that um, not much was known about it. Uh, the Italians know about it, but for whatever reason, it's like a lot of things about the war in Italy, it just didn't get a lot of attention. Um, Lella was 17 when he starts doing this. He's a big guy. He's been in the mountains since he was six or seven. He's a tremendous skier uh, and he's a good mountaineer. And what I think is this uncanny ability to connect to people. I mean, really, as I said, he's a very warm person. And that's the way I depict him in the climbs. Now, I couldn't tell a story of 30, you know, 35 climbs. It was, no one would read the book. Um, so, you know, I was a dramatist here. Once I decided that I was telling the story as a, as historical fiction, um, I freely took the best parts of the, the escapes and I put them all into two big escapes, which is what you see. That, that's a perfect segue because, uh, I was, I was just going to ask, I, I noticed on one of these author's blogs, a guy, uh, the, the blogger writes about historical fiction facing the writer with a, what he called an ethical trilemma. How much fact, how much fiction, and how to get the balance right. right. Too much fact, you kill the story. Too much fix it, fiction, you deny the history. Mm -hmm. And not getting it right, is unethical. Mm -hmm. So how did you meet this challenge? Uh, a lot of work, a lot of talking, a lot of calling Pino back on the phone, a lot of interviewing people on repeated trips to Italy, to Germany, um, and just talking to as many people as I could. I was able to find former partisans who were able to confirm a lot of the stuff about how the partisans worked and how they aided in the escape of Jews. Um, various books that I was able to confirm. There was a, a book by a guy named Max Corvo, who was an OSS, the top OSS agent in uh, Italy, who confirmed in one of his books parts of Pino's story as it relates to general layers. Um, I spent a bunch of time, as I said, at that uh, Shoah Foundation, you know, reading the materials that they had. I don't speak Italian, but Pino was translating, and we took archival copies with us. Um, you know, there's, there's no doubt that Barbaresky set up this system. We called it Oscar. It's a well-known thing in Italy, certainly. It was 
this Catholic Scouts. Remember what I said that the Boy Scouts would become important. Well, um, Barbaresky was a big time Boy Scout as a kid. They called them the Aguiles Landage. It means the uh, Wandering Eagles. And they were banned by Mussolini uh, in the last 10 years of his reign. But there were secret members of them, especially up in the Alps. And where in the Val Cordera area, um, it was those Boy Scouts who led the Jews up. Um, and that's pretty well documented, you know, in the Shoah Foundation and um, in the various things that Barbaresky has written and that things have been written about Barbaresky. Did you get a sense of uh, how much quiet support he may have gotten from the Catholic hierarchy in Italy? You know, this is like the most controversial thing about the whole thing in Italy is, you know, let's just cut right to it. Um, was Pope Pius complicit with Hitler? I can't answer that question, and I don't think anybody's been able to answer it, but I think we're about to know, right? Because they are going to let people into the Vatican archives to look at it. So I think there will be a definitive answer. What's clear is that um, Catholics across Nazi-occupied Italy helped Jews. They did it in monasteries, like um, the monastery in Assisi, which was built by St. Francis of Assisi. They kept hundreds of Jews hidden in the basement of that uh, monastery. Um, they were in uh, nunneries. They were, some of them were hidden in the Vatican itself. Um, were there Catholics who turned in Jews? I'm sure, and there are un undoubtedly documented cases of it. But something happened. And the common thing that I heard was that there was an oral order given. And this is by people who were participating in the escapes or fighting the Nazis in the mountains, that the order said that save anyone you can from persecution. And so that's reflected. I decided I can't get into that aspect of it. Um, and I'm going down a rabbit hole. And first of all, Pino Lella never met the Pope. And that became my defining um, scalpel, if you will, for the book. I, the thing was like 850 pages at one point, and there were bigger discussions of Father Barbareski and how he set up Val Cordera and some of the cool things that happened in Milan with these Boy Scouts peddling all around delivering fake documents to Jews hiding in and around Milan. But it had to go because Pino wasn't part of it. Um, and that became, if Pino was part of it, it stayed in the book. If he wasn't, it went out. Uh, the next section involves Pino working with, uh, as a driver yeah. for the head of the organization, Tut, which was in charge, if you will, of, uh, the industrialization effort of, of the war, both in Germany and, and in Italy. And in that way, he became uh, a spy. I guess that would be the best word. Mm -hmm. um, how, how much were you able to confirm independently of his work? That, that Layers was there, that Layers did all this? No, that, that Pino actually was participating as... Well, I mean, he's been telling people, he didn't talk very much about this, but, you know, he's been telling people aspects of the story going back 60 years. Um, people knew about it shortly after the war. Um, his brothers knew about it. They talked to uh, Pino's kids about it. But it was largely this. Um, that he had gone to Casalpino to escape the bombardment of Milan because their house got hit, right? Um, they, they, it was like a typical atelier situation where there were craftsmen behind the building, there was a store out front, and then the, the family lived above. That was fairly common. And their place got hit. It was very close to uh, the Duomo in central um, lawn and he had to go up there. So he goes up there and he describes being trained by uh, Father Ray. Um, how do I confirm that they led Jews out of there? Well, I interviewed the historians in Campo Docino. I interviewed the mayor of Medesimo, whose father was part of it. Um, I interviewed a guy who had his eye blown out in the grenade um, section of the book. And they that just was, said, that was a particularly painful part of the book. Uh, oh my God, right? I mean, 
these guys cavalierly. Now, this wasn't the Nazis. This was, you know, a so-called partisan group, although they seemed to be renegade. And they left the grenade and a boy dies and another kid gets his leg blown off and another kid goes blind. And, then, um, and you know, the thing is, is that they, the thing was, I was in awe of the entire time is that Lella and these other people, they weren't getting anything out of this. Thing. You know, they were risking their lives to help these people. You, you mentioned earlier that y you freely combined uh, 30 rescues into one. Um, two. 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 Okay. Could, could you talk about the uh, composite character and sure. how, how you sure. did that? Yeah. So um, once, you know, I know the, the difference between uh, fact and fiction. Uh, you know, Gabriel Garcia Marquez believed that if you included one piece of fiction in a work of nonfiction, the whole thing is fiction. But by the same token, if there's one fact in fiction, it makes it all valid to write about. Um, I had way more than one fact. Uh, as we went forward, I was able to see that there were going to be gaps in the story that I wasn't going to be able to close, that I couldn't explain, and it didn't seem to be explained in the documentation. And so I basically used my own suspicions and logical leaps to take that um, and to sow that narrative. So Again, um, I felt free to take different people and make them into one. So, so people have asked about the character of Mrs. Napolitano, who is one of my favorite characters in the book. And um, she's a composite. She's a composite of three people. One, a pregnant woman. Two, a violinist who played at La Scala. And three, a woman who was older and had to be skied down the mountain on Pino's back. Um, did the concert in the woods take place? Yeah, she, the violinist played for them, which she still could never forget. Um, you know, all these things happened, but there's no way I was gonna be able to tell three of them and I wanted them all in there. So I put them in. And uh, if people criticize the book because they say, well, you know, this couldn't have happened and so on and so forth, the answer is it's fiction. You know, I'm a dramatist. If this was a movie, a movie maker wouldn't hesitate to do that. <laughs> okay. Wouldn't hesitate. Um, what would you like people to take away after reading this book? Well, I think the thing I love is that, two things, actually. One of them is that we are all capable of being more than ourselves. That given the, the correct situation, given times of stress, there will always be heroes, un, unsung heroes, people who do it not out of any kinds of belief that they're going to get something out of it. They act to help other people altruistically. And I think in this day and age, we need those kind of stories. Um, I think there's too much divisiveness in society. I think there's too many people who are looking out for themselves rather than others. And uh, the second thing I want to say is that you know, people have asked me what's the best part about this book. I mean, it's, it's being published in 37 languages and uh, it's sold millions of copies and it's going to be a mini series. And I, I always say that's all fantastic. But the things that I love is that the, the, the letters I get from people who picked up the book when they were severely depressed and or suicidal and they read it and they read what this kid went through at 17 and it basically say, changes their lives. And I get these letters a lot and it's the best part about it. And uh, I've, been, I've been looking at some of the questions coming on the sure. side over here. Uh, just, uh, did you have any problem? What, describe the problems you had in trying to track down the history of General Lairs. Well, the single biggest problem was documentations burning and being burnt in the last year of the war, um, the last few months of the war. And that took place across all um, parts of the Nazi apparatus. Um, the uh, guy who was uh, Colonel Ralph, who's the head of the Gestapo in Milan, when he's actually captured, 
he's burning documents, um, trying to burn himself out of history. The organization Tote, uh, you know, as you said, was in charge of industrialization, but I like to simplify it. They were in charge of the supply lines. Whatever the generals needed, whatever Hitler needed, they supplied it. And they either made it themselves or they had someone else made it and paid them or they stole it. And as the war pro uh, progresses, it's increasingly stolen. Um, and Layers is in charge of uh, thousands, uh, tens of thousands of slaves. That's, that's the only other term you can use. They call them forced laborers. And they brought them and they're the guys who build all these fortifications and um, in the last days of the war, you know, Pinot describes layers going from uh, organization tote office to tote office, burning certain documents and taking others. Now, at one time, um, if I'm remembering this correctly, including the people who were in uniform and the people who were enslaved, there were between 10 and 11 million people controlled by the organization TOE, which by the way, built the concentration camps. Um, and often the concentration camps were disguised as, as organization TOE, quote, work camps. And um, so when I did my research, when I went to uh, Berlin and Freiburg, for example, I figured, you know, the, the germ, the Nazis were incredible record keepers. And I figured I was gonna be there for weeks on end looking at the stuff. And I hired a Fulbright scholar um, who's a friend of mine's son and we sat there in front of it. But when we got there, you know, all the, the documentation that survived could be in like two or three, now it was on microfiche, but still two or three different um, uh, cabinets. And I was like, this is impossible. This thing was huge. And um, I think a lot of the organization totes role in the Holocaust has been largely erased because of that burning and destruction. So that was the single biggest thing um, that I faced was that destruction of, of documentation. And uh, you, uh, you said yesterday you faced the same thing in Poland, correct? Yeah, when I was doing research for my book, uh, I went through a lot of archives, but in my case, I, I was pretty fortunate I, between Germany, Poland, uh, the United States, uh, and different sources, uh, I was able to actually assemble more than 20 documents with uh, my father's name on it and, and oh. make the timeline from 42 to 45, confirming a lot of the stories, I guess, that I'm sure Pino uh, would have loved to have uh, confirmed as well. Uh, it's hard without the documentary evidence there. And, but, and you know, I have uh, a lot of, the cumulative weight of the evidence that I found supports his story. Um, and I'll give you an example. He would say certain things happened in such and such a place, such as um, uh, Layers headquarters in Coma, which was the, the soccer stadium. And I have document, and he would, you know, Pino would say, well, we were here at certain, certain dates or, you know, right in this time frame, And I found documentation putting layers right there in those time frames. He describes going to um, uh, Mussolini's area. There's documentation showing that layers had multiple interactions with Mussolini, that he seemed to be a, a go-between of some sort. Um, because he was always talking to him, it had to do with the fact that as the war progressed, they weren't, the Germans weren't paying the Italian factories like Fiat and places like that that took over their manufacturing base. And there were strikes. And, you know, a strike was, was brutal for layers because he's getting it from not only from Albert Speer, but Hitler and Mussolini. And he's trying to keep the machine going to support the Germans. So, you know, I have that. One of the big stories in, that I loved in the story was the story of the radio and how um, they snuck it into um, Pino's parents' house. This was a shortwave that was used by the partisans to communicate um, with the allies. 
and uh, Pino described in detail this suitcase. And when I'm in the, the U.S. National Archives researching the, the OSS in Italy, there's a picture of the exact um, suitcase as he described it, like uncannily. Uh, and so then you ask as a, as a journalist, all right, so he could have studied this. He could have invented this whole story. And I go, yeah, but he never, he never tried to do anything with it. He never talked to anybody um, to try to get himself celebrated in any way whatsoever. Uh, you know, when I called him, he, he was baffled that I wanted to talk to him. You know? He's still alive. He is. He's 93. He guy's a, a physical machine. He rides uh, an e-bike on cobblestones uh, all over town. And if he's not on the e-bike, he runs. Uh, you know, mentally, he's 93. He has good days and bad days. But he's still the same warm, genuine person. What, when was the last time you've been in touch with him? Well, I talked to him about a month ago. And then we saw him, my wife and I went to see him in late August of last year. We usually go once a year to see him. But with COVID, yeah, I think it's unlikely we'll get to see him you know, for a while. But this guy's tough. I'm, I'm predicting he'll live to 100, no problem. Uh, Mark, I'd like to thank you a lot for your time. Uh, Samantha, if you could come back. <laughs> Here you are. I'll throw it over to you uh, for uh, questions, I guess. Sure. Um, we have a lot of questions coming in, and please keep them coming. Um, people want to know, there's been some buzz about uh, this mini-series um, adaptation of the book. Can you tell yeah. us more about that? Yeah, so when the book was originally optioned, it was optioned as a movie. And uh, my oldest son, Connor, who's also a novelist, um, he went to uh, USC and, and majored in uh, film and uh, creative writing and screenwriting. And he was saying the whole time, it's not a movie. You're going to butcher it if it's a movie. And Tom Holland, um, his grandfather is a huge fan of the book. He's read it like five times. And they got to talking and they realized that it was going to go one of two ways. Either it was going to be all about the Alps or it was going to be all about the line. And one of them was going to get eliminated. And that would have been a crime because it's really the sweep of the whole story that um, achieves its power. And so Holland went back. Um, I think they'd gotten this reaction by a couple of A-list screenwriters who looked at it too. And so they came to back to me and they said, would you be terribly upset if uh, we made a six part, six hour um, limited series about it? And I went, no. I mean, two hours to six, I'll take the six. So um, they hired a showrunner in the world of television. The showrunner is king, except the chief writer. In the world of uh, movies, the director is king. So uh, we have a guy named Sean Ryan, who uh, did a famous television show called The Shield. Uh, and he won a bunch of uh, Emmys for it. And he's really smart and uh, gets the book. And he and our playwright, uh, from Scotland of all places, and I, I'm, I'm dropping his name in my memory, uh, have written a pilot. And uh, just as COVID hit, they were going out to seek financing to film. That's where we are. We're on hold like every other right. production like, in Hollywood. Like everything else. Um, yeah. How did you first learn the story of Pino? Yeah, so um, for people who haven't read this story, I hear this story on the worst day of my life. Um, my little brother, who was also my best friend, had drunk himself to death uh, in June of 2005. And by the time it gets out to February of 2006, um, a book that I loved uh, called The Serpent's Kiss uh, basically bombed in the United States and people were telling me I was never going to be able to publish under my own name again. And my wife and I are in this long lingering business dispute that took us to the point of personal bankruptcy. And I'm driving to Costco uh, in a deep depression on a snowy day uh, on I-90 and I realized I was worth more dead than alive. 
And uh, I had a big you know, life insurance policy because I had you know, kids with teenagers. And um, I seriously considered driving into a bridge above me. Uh, I didn't do it because they, the images of my kids and what it would do to my wife uh, stopped me. But I got to Costco as you know, just as rattled as I've ever been in my entire life. And uh, you know, I guess I had some sort of nervous breakdown. I put my head on the steering wheel and I'd, I'd be nervous for a story, something that would give me purpose and, and you know, that the stories that I work on mattered. And uh, I go into Costco, do my thing. I go home, my wife's sick in bed. She has stomach flu. And she says, you gotta go to the friends um, Robinson's uh, for dinner tonight. And I said, I'm not going to the dinner party. And she said, you have to, we've canceled three times. Just go and, uh, and spend an hour. And if you still feel the same way, excuse yourself. And I go to this um, dinner party and there's a, a sometime screenwriter um, who lives in Bozeman who's there. And he asked me what's going on. And I said, I'm looking for a story that could possibly be the basis of a long form narrative nonfiction. And he sits there and he thinks and he goes, well, I heard a story. And he starts telling me the story of Pinot White. And that basically it was the story of a 17 year old boy, you know, leads Jews escaping Nazi occupied Italy over the Alps in the winter of 43, 44. And then through a series of remarkable circumstances becomes a spy inside the German high command. And I was like, no, you know, no. And he said, well, yeah, and I think he's alive. Now when he's, how old is he? And he said, what, 78, 79? And, you know, one thing led to another and I went home. My wife's looking at me and she goes, what happened to you? And I said, I don't know, but if I can prove enough that this is true over the phone, I think I'm going to take the last of my money and go to Italy to chase a 60 year old war story. And, you know, my wife being my wife, she looked at me and she goes, well, of course you will. And six weeks later, I get off a plane and there he is. He's a big, larger than life character. Um, we go out, he had this little Citroën de Chevaux, which I know, if you know anything about it, it's a wildly underpowered vehicle. Um, and he gets in it, his head's like this, and he immediately starts to drive it like a Ferrari through the streets of Italy. And I'm like terrified. It's like the most brilliant driving I've ever seen. And so Mel, you asked how I know, how did I prove that Pino Lella can drive like nobody's business? Yeah. I've been in the car with him and he's done it. <laughs> so when he started describing these, you know, his driving feats, I was like, I believe 100% of it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> a lot of Italian drivers drive like that. Yeah, yeah but no, I mean, he actually had Ferraris and raced Ferraris. Uh, of so. course. Yeah. Uh, Mark, can you tell us uh, about the book that you're currently working on? Yeah, I'm really excited about it. Um, people told me that I would never find another true untold story of World War II um, to base a novel on. And I was like, no, I really think I will. And sure enough, uh, when Beneath published, all of a sudden people were coming out of the woodwork and sending me letters about their grandparents or, you know, various stories of, you know, great emotional turmoil where people triumphed over adversity. And it became soon very clear to me that I had to have a criteria. What am I, how am I gonna choose? And what am I gonna do? And so my criteria became that the story needs to um, be inherently moving, inspiring, healing, and potentially transformative to readers. Um, and I wasn't getting that. I mean, I got a lot of great stories. I really thought that they were amazing, but there wasn't that angle to it. And then uh, in November of, uh, this would have been 17, so about five, six months after the book comes out, I'm doing a talk uh, here at, in Bozeman, Montana, where I live at the local Rotary. And this guy comes up afterwards and he says, have you ever heard the story of the Martells? And I said, you mean the construction people? Because there's this big construction company in Bozeman. And, uh, uh, he says, the entire time that I read the book, um, uh, 
uh, I was thinking of the, of the uh, Martell story. So a couple days later, Bill Martell, who's like in almost 80, gives me a call and tells me, I heard you want to write the story, her, you want to hear the story? And I said, sure. And a couple of days later, I put his address into my nav and it's like two miles from where I live. And I go down and it tells me to take a left and I'm going into this neighborhood and I'm getting this weird feeling. And I get out in the driveway and I figure out why I can't be 250 yards from where Pino's um, story came to me. Uh, so I go in and I know within 15 minutes I'm telling the story because it's about a family of Ukrainian refugees, mom, dad, two little boys. And right in 19, March of 1944, they're faced with this terrible decision. There are ethnic Germans who have been living in Ukraine for like four or five generations. And under Stalin and the Soviet regime, they were kicked off their lands and impoverished and persecuted. Hitler comes in in 41 and gives them back their land. Um, they have it for about 18 months, Stalin counterattacks. And so they're faced with this decision. As the Nazis retreat, do we um, stay and wait for the bear, the Soviet bear to return and we'll probably get shipped to Siberia? Or do we run with the wolves, the SS that's been assigned to protect people like the uh, Martels who are um, Heinrich Himmler believed were the purest Aryans because they had lived in isolation in the Ukraine. And it's the story, this incredible story of, um, at first, how they run and they're caught between two armies, the, the, the German army retreating and the Soviet army advancing. And then it just, be, and they're in a wagon, by the way, with two horses. And um, anyway, it follows them all the way through the end of the war when the unthinkable happens, when the father uh, gets captured by the Soviets and sent to a Soviet prison camp. And she goes on with the two boys walking and eventually he escapes and comes all the way across only to find out that she's on the wrong side of the Iron Curtain and she has to escape. And it's just one of the more remarkable stories I've ever heard. So it's called The Last Green Valley. It'll be out in May of 2021. Great. Yeah. Um, we have time for just one more question before we, we wrap up. Uh, the question is, what was the most challenging part of the novel to write? Yeah, that's easy. Um, the chaos that occurred in the last three days of the war and shortly afterwards. Uh, this is one of the reasons, if not the main reason, that even Italians don't talk about the war. Um, the, the country, the northern part of the country, descended into anarchy. You know, as, as the Germans start to retreat and the fascists are engaging in a civil war with the partisans. So there's like a three-way war with the Allies coming. And there were a lot of vendetta killings that took place in those days. Uh, at one point, they were, you know, there were documents that show that almost 500 bodies a night were being gathered from the streets and taken to the Cemeterio Monumentale, uh, the big cemetery in Milan, which was turned into an open air morgue. And that's described in the book. Um, that whole sequence was tremendously difficult to write. Um, so that's about all the time that we have for today. Do you have any closing thoughts, anything that you want to add for, for our viewers watching? I'm just pleased that everybody showed up and I hope they could understand me. <laughs>